Wherever you're watching us from around Australia and around the world, it's an exciting day to join us. It's episode 22 of Oz Longboarding. An appropriate number, 22, two, the, the two numbers side by side. It sort of symbolises the twins. And tonight we're joined by two of the maddest twins you're ever going to meet. Mick and Dan Corbett are joining us today from various parts of Western Australia. But first, we're going to do a lap around the country and speak to our regular hosts. So first of all, we'll start off on the Sunshine Coast. And uh, big happy Thursday to Kira Molnar. How's things up there this week? Hey guys, how are you going? We've had a few waves on the Sunshine Coast. It's been pretty windy, but even so, there's been a few waves around on the opens, a couple of waves through the points over the last weekend, um, but a little bit of sunshine. And we did have one day of rain for those of you who were wondering if it did rain on the Sunshine Coast at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually is a thing, it does happen. Great to see you changed your picture to a West Aussie photo this week as well in honour of our uh, special guests. That's good to see. How, how long ago was that in WA? Was that uh, Nationals or before that or? <laughs> yep. um, that was not last year, the year before for um, the whalebone. We were down there and then drove down south to... So two years ago. Nice one. That's where, where the uh, the boys cut their teeth surfing some of the breaks down in the southwest there. So you got a little bit of a taste of it. That's not the biggest day by looks of things, but uh, that was so definitely not one of the biggest days. No, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So we'll move a bit further south at the <laughs> Gold Coast, straddling uh, Queensland and New South Wales. Welcome along this week, Sean McEwen. G'day, everybody. Um, just while we've got you there, Kira. Um, can you confirm uh, whether the dates for the Noosa Festival have been released because um, I've heard through the grapevine it's moved to May and it's looking at the 15th to the 23rd of May. I can't yeah. confirm the exact dates, but I have heard the exact same thing and I believe it is likely that it is going to be moved to those dates in May rather than March. Okay, and they're going to do the um, moves to logs in March. They've sort of swapped Around, yeah, they've moved things around a bit. I'll double check this week and confirm next week with you, um, suss it out, but that is what I heard on the great fun. All right. Anyway, here down here on the sunny uh, Gold Coast, um, yeah, a couple of rubbish days earlier in the week, um, swell started pumping um, oh, Tuesday afternoon, uh, cleaned up. A little bit yesterday afternoon, this morning. Um, yeah, sweet as it gets through from outside, greeny all the way through, just five to six foot on the, some of the sets. Um, always a cast of thousands. But uh, yeah, if you could get one, they look really nice. Seeing some great photos starting to uh, come across the interweb. And speaking of great photos, looks like you've been scoring again, Matty Chinoski down in Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, we had coming off that amazing winter. We we definitely had about fifteen to twenty days through you know August and early September, which were just so good and uncrowded because everyone was surfed out, me included. Um, there's been a few days here and there. Um, that clip that's been re recently released by FCS was for a couple of uh, oh, probably about six weeks ago, and that was a clip resulting from that. So it wasn't as current as you may. Uh, you may think, but um, but uh, yeah, nonetheless, it's nice to see uh, footage come of something like that. Uh, but yeah, waves around here, pretty summery. Uh, Norris winds well, a um, few off early morning offshores. Uh, we have our annual five ways into club contest on the northern beaches uh, tomorrow, on Saturday, sorry. Uh, so that'll be Manly hosting Curl Curl, Long Reef, um, Freshwater and Palm Beach. And that's going to be very exciting because... Uh, Long Reef One, that's my club last year, and uh, all the clubs have been uh, banding together and trying to get their best strength sides uh, amped up. And um, yeah, we're all going to be chomping at the bit. So I'll give you guys the results of that uh, in um, on next Thursday. Oh, well, good luck with that, and uh, hopefully some good news. But the great news right now is that WA is making up half the show this week. 
So uh, as well as myself, <laughs> I'm just north of Perth in a little town called Lancelin and I haven't even seen the beach this week. I've been busily rust repairing on trucks and things. But uh, in the Perth metropolitan area, we've got uh, Dan Corbett and from the northwest up in the Pilbara is uh, twin brother Mick. But we'll start with you, Dan. Welcome to Oz Longboarding, mate. Thanks for having me, guys. Now, I know you've been getting some surf lately, you little frother. Talk us through that. What have you been up to? Well, I wouldn't say frothing one to two foot slop, but um, <laughs> still keen to get out there. It's kind of that summertime now, so it's yeah, kind of getting a bit average at home lately. So I had a good winter, which was the main thing, so kind of still living off that. So. That's why I'm calling you a frother, because you've actually been surfing in the last couple of weeks in Perth. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I went to drop my back to Dan the other day and he said he was going for a surf and I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. It was all late in the afternoon and windy and then like three hours later, he just got home. So good to see you're still getting out there. I know it's not going to get better. At least you've got the opportunity to go for a surf. Not so much Sorry. twin brother Miko, uh, about 1,800 kilometres north of where you're currently sitting. Uh, how's things up there in Port Hedland, Mick? Pretty good, mate. Uh, been fishing heaps and it's about 40 degrees today, so... Actually got down to the beach, it was pretty, pretty good, but um, yeah, no worries for me. I haven't really surfed since February, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, Dan's winning at the moment as far as who's getting <laughs> Winning something. <laughs> He's most certainly winning. <laughs> uh, Nick, you're a new father as well, mate. Congratulations on behalf of all the, uh, the surfing tribe who haven't yet had a chance to pat you on the back. Yes, uh, thank uh, you. I was hoping to catch up last time you were in Perth, but Dan told me that people you actually like rocked up instead. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a quick hit and run. I didn't one. make the list. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, great that you're able to, to get up and down. So uh, just talk us through what are you up to at the moment? Because obviously people would have seen you in the both, both of you guys in the media as uh, you know the surfing tradies along with Jared Foster, but. Um, you're not so much a tradesman now. You sort of moved up in the corporate world a bit into the into the uh, the mining world. Where, what are you doing up there? Yeah, so um, I work for BHP. So I'm based at Finnegan Island, which is one half of the port there. So basically, I'm an electrical coordinator there for shutdown. So any shutdown that happens, all the electrical goes through me basically, and I plan it in and engage contractors and whatnot to come and perform that work. So. That's sort of been my life for the last year and a half, I guess. So it's been good though. There's a lot of flexibility and stuff. So I'm able to get away when I can. Yeah. But the bub has sort of stopped me from doing that now. So it's great having him. Don't get me wrong. I'd like <laughs> to surf a bit more though. <laughs> so for anyone who's never worked on the mines, basically what Mick just said is he gets paid a shitload of money for not doing much at all. <laughs> hey, mate, we work hard. We work hard. <laughs> yeah, every time there's a shut. But uh, and what about yourself, Dan? You've um, you've got your own business in the uh, in the metro area as well. Yeah, I do actually. I work for myself, and I also work for another company. I actually just uh, picked up a ticket just last week, rope access. So I'm currently hanging myself off the side of buildings at the moment. So uh, just another way to get the adrenaline pumping through the veins, I guess. That's why you have to have I mean, a you have to chat, have a chat with Eagle about getting out on the rigs with him, doing the rope access stuff. That'd be fun. But yeah, like, I'm still, still gonna work my way up. But it's, I'm getting there. <laughs> now I've known you guys since you were kids, so I'm gonna uh, step out the way for a minute. I'm sure Kira and Matt, you guys, uh, like the opportunity to pick Dan and Mick's brains. I think maybe we should start with uh, how you how you got into surfing in the first place and uh, fire it off from there. Uh, well, just going up to Wedge Island, actually. That's where we learned to surf, learned to drive. It's where it all began, I think. Just that wedge, little Wedge Island. Because you could pick a little, nice little bank on the, like, anywhere along the beach and have it to yourself. And that's where it all really began, I reckon. I was about five years old, I reckon, when we got our first surfboards. Dad, and, um, yeah, for Dad sure. found them on the tip. Was, was, yeah. you, was Phil always a surfer? Your dad, Phil, was he surfing when you were like little groms? Yeah, sort of not really, eh? Like he's sort of more just down the beach cruising. Um, he did get into surfing a little bit, but he wasn't, I guess, real passionate. He's more passionate about racing and football, I guess. Yeah. It's about Hang on. So why longboarding then? Because obviously uh, when I first met you guys, you were already shortboarding as well, but I didn't know that at the time. 
But um, so how did you get in? How did two young guys in WA become competitive longboarders? Because that's an unusual pathway. I remember my first longboard comp. It was for Indian Ocean. I can't remember what year, but dad joined it. And I came down within one weekend and started just doing it as like a junior. I would have been probably 13, I reckon, 20 years ago. <laughs> um, and then just kind of blossomed from there. Started doing a long like club comps, got into like the big comps around, around town and then started doing state rounds and slowly progressed from there. So who, who had, I mean, we're going to do lots of twin comparisons, like who's the best at yeah. stuff and all that sort of thing. Who had the best uh, competitive longboard results out of you two? Uh, I reckon Daniel had two, eh? For sure. But he also yeah. got both fired one comp for cutting me off twice. So that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was spewing. I was spewing. But uh, yeah, I reckon Dan took the cake on that one. He probably definitely won the most, I reckon. Cool. Dan, you've been a state champion, haven't you? I've been a state champ. Yeah. Only once. A lot of bridesmaids. Always the Jared, or Ron, one of them. Always beat me. But, um, yeah, got one, one state championship under the belt, so I was pretty happy with that. Retired after that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Mick? What's your best comp result for the longboards? Uh, it would have been runner-up in the state championships in the juniors, for sure, I reckon. Um, Got a couple thirds and fourths in the opens, I think. But yeah, that was about it, really. But you both surfed in ASP stroke uh, WSL longboard events as well. How, do, how have you guys gone in those two? Not too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always got tough. To maybe made like one uh, round, which was a rapid charge, and then <laughs> <laughs> got knocked out in the next seat. Well, it was always good experiences going over there. Like we did Noosa, done by your, your comp, Sean, and I'm on, at Kingscliff. And it was actually just great going over there and hanging out with the guys over race so we don't get to see all the time. That was, that was probably the best part of it, I think. It used to be pretty cool back in the day and travel, traveling around uh, different different place every time. And then I started doing nationals. They just put it in Port Macquarie for the next decade. But... Um, <laughs> I was like, this is my chance to go around Australia and then yeah. just stop. <laughs> I, I, I saw for three different states over five years, but the Nationals were at the same place for all five years. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, imagine surfing Bells. The Bells Mate, would have been awesome. Bells comp, the Nationals, that last one they had at Bells was all time. That was as good as it gets. Well, I was watching it and they, they, they had, they, that, even that uh, one at Middleton was pretty good fun. But... um. They had bells and they had uh, snapper on, yeah, um, and it was just, I was going, this is sick. I'm going to go do this, go to National to get to surf these iconic breaks with only three or four other people in the water. And then, <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to go surf Port Macquarie yeah. uh, for the next five years. <laughs> hey, mate, Bonnie Hills is all right. You got Bonnie Hills is all right. <laughs> yeah, now there's a couple of good breaks around Port, you know, like that. Um, Middle Rock, I've been there when it's been pumping. Yeah, that's well worth it. Uh, there's some great waves around it, but there's not, none of those iconic breaks. It's not like you're not surfing the Superbank. You're not surfing the Bells well, Beach. The, the, bizarre thing about, the, the bizarre thing about having those Aussies there at Port is that, no joke, within 45 minutes, north and south, you actually have some legitimate world-class point breaks that are really, really consistent. Um, and they, they do have back beaches too, but... My mind uh, is always just blown. It's just we all trekked somewhere like like Port, and it's thought it's just not. I mean, this fun waves for sure is definitely options for a contest venue. But as a surfer to go that far, you do always want to go for uh, quality if you can get it. It's not a hundred percent. Hundred percent. So for anyone who did you guys? Sorry, go I was going to say, do you guys like riding um, bigger waves on the short boards as well? Uh, sorry, on the long boards when you're. I guess did you find that as an advantage if the waves were a bit bigger or? I'll be honest, I did one Australian titles. It was, I think it was that Bonnie Hills, or I can't remember where exactly where it was, but it was big. And I had, I remember I had like Dame Pioli in my head. I had like two other good guys. And I was like, I was pretty much shooting myself in for a fourth. Went out <laughs> there, couldn't hear commentators, couldn't hear anything. Surf, just 
kind of just didn't worry about it and then came in and Dane came up, gave me a hug. He's like, man, you won, you won. I'm like, what? I thought I came four. Oh. Um, so there is a little advantage because we always surf on a big sloppy waves. So there is for sure. Yeah, I definitely think so too. Like when we had the nationals at yelling up too, like we all tended to, I guess, make the quarterfinals and semifinals, you know. So I do think it helps if it's a bit larger. Yeah. Now, I was so proud of you boys, along with uh, Jared, of course, the, uh, the, the, the third, met, third partner in the, the terrible trio. Um, not so much Ryan Goddard, a bit of a pussy, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when the Nationals were on at Yelling Up, um, I know there was a couple of service we had at the bubble, and then there was that one afternoon when they moved to uh, NG Car Park because it was too big and none of the competitors wanted to paddle out without filling in their wheels. And a few of us paddled out, yeah. the West Aussie boys, to sort of go, yeah, fly the flag. And I was so proud yeah. of you guys. And that was kind of when I went, hang on a minute, these guys have got a bit of a nutbag about them. When was it that you decided that instead of just surfing big waves, you wanted to surf stupid waves? So while you talk us through this, I'm, I'm going to um, share a couple of photos just for anyone who's been um, living under a rock uh, for the last yeah. couple of years who aren't exactly sure who you guys are. Um, you got me. Well, um, I'll tell you what, Dan was the one that sort of started it, Dan and Jarrett, eh? So, um, I don't know, when did you start surfing, Dan? It was like 19, 20? Yeah, yeah, I remember in about 2009, I got back from a Europe holiday, backpacking, went down south, a bit overweight and not surfed yet. And remember when we surfed um, Sisters? Yeah. That big that slab left? And I let go and went, I just had to straighten out. Next thing you know, I'm up against a cliff. And I remember like finally getting back out of the back, like struggling. I thought I was going to die. Got out of the back and I said, oh, I'm, I'm never doing this again. And then moved down south pretty much straight after that. And then just slowly built myself into it. Just surfing like, secret little bummies around like, at home and then slowly progressing. And then one afternoon, I was working with Jared on the tools and, He's like, oh, do you want to go to Cow Bobby? And I was like, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, why not? And then next thing you know, I think it was that, that session. I got one of the top five biggest waves in the world for that year. And it was my sec first time out there. It was, I think it was my second wave. I only got three waves. But, <laughs> and then after that, it just kind of took off. I just loved it. And then, well, I went to Indo. I went to Indo for a couple of years and left all my stuff for Mick. And then... Mick took over and went Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll tell you what, like, I guess like the first time I surfed like a big wave like that would have been at the right. I think you were there, Dan. You would have come back yeah, from right. one time. Yeah. And then um, I hadn't surfed cow before. And like, I'll tell you what, I was always super nervous about surfing cow. Like I'd seen Dan's photos and stuff. And I was like, always like super nervous about it. And um. One day, like, we sort of saw a four and a half metre swell coming up the coast, and we're like, oh, we'll go and surf a cow. Give it a shot. Like, we've just been down at the right and doing whatever. We're like, yeah, it should be about 20 foot. won't be too big. We'll go and give it a shot. We got there, and, like, um, I don't know, it was only about five and a half, six and a half metre swell. It ended up being, and um, it ended up being huge. It's probably one of the biggest I've ever seen it, if not the biggest I've ever seen it. And, um, yeah, sort of sort of like scissor paper rock for the first wave and I won. I didn't really want to win because it was so big, but um it was just so perfect and the best I've ever seen. And like you would have seen those photos just before. I reckon that would have been about the fourth wave at that wave. And I've never been so scared in my life, to tell you the truth. So <laughs> it's um pretty epic. And then yeah, like um no I didn't yeah, actually one. that's the I, one. I actually didn't make that wave. Like um Got barreled, but uh, didn't make it out at the end. But um, sort of after getting barreled like that and actually surviving, I realised like we're sort of not made of glass. So sort of pushed me into bigger yeah, things. On, on, just stop for a second, Mick. What are you thinking at this point here where you see this whole... If you go back to the shot <laughs> behind the first shot, I'm like shitting myself. I'm like... <laughs> Am I going to die? Because like, I didn't know if it was going to barrel yeah. or not. And Man, I was going to ask you about that. Um, obviously, that first shot, you are anticip you're lined appropriately to... Obviously, the only way out of that situation is to pull in. And if that yeah. doesn't barrel, you know, you're in, you're in a trouble. pretty big problem, <laughs> aren't you? 
<laughs> Mate, I tell you what, I was coming down it like because um, I got a heap of confidence up after the first three waves. I was like, I'll go deeper and I'll try and like do like a carve down the face or something. And then like I let go and I realised like I was so deep. I was like, oh my God, like do I straighten out? Do I like try and pull in? Like I was like, no, nah, if I straighten out, I'm going to die. Like I just try and pull in, hopefully it barrels. And like, honestly, I was just looking up and down, up and down, just looking at that lip. Because so if it was going to like land on me, I was just going to jump straight off and try and pin, pin drop through it. And then it started throwing over. I was like, oh my God, it's barreling. And like, it's funny, if you zoom in on these photos, on the high res photos, you can see my face and my like, jaw is like on the floor. I'm like, oh my God. Like, it's pretty scary. Like, I was like, then I started pumping through and I was like, coming through. I was like, fuck, I think I'm going to make this. And then it like sucked in, like the barrel brave, like sucked me in and then just shot me off my board. Like, it's pretty yeah. powerful. But, um, and did you bo- watch it? beforehand like you said that was your third or fourth wave uh, obviously you knew it was barreling but like what was the process you know for your first session out there how long did you watch it and you know observe it before you actually fired up the ski uh we sat there and watched one set come free and um jamie's like fuck you guys got to get out there that was huge so i was sitting with brad and brad's like yep let's uh do this a paper rock see you guys first and he's like yep you won so I pretty much just hopped off the ski with my board and um, got towed out the back and another set came, went down that one. I think the second one I got um, a come off on. And then, yeah, I think the third one was the normal one. But then um, I sort of stopped for a bit. So I got on the ski and um, towed Jamie around because he was filming or taking photos. So I sat there for like another, I guess, an hour while Jared and Brad had their shots. And then that one came in and I was like, I was on the back of the ski getting tired and like, I didn't really think anything of it. I wasn't planning on getting barreled or anything. I was sort of just trying to go down a bit deeper and that's sort of what eventuated. Because Cow Bombie doesn't normally barrel, just for the record. I mean, it's, it's not, not, not a classic barreling wave. It's more of a big mush burger normally. Um, yeah. so when you see it's throwing over like that, that's a lot of ocean moving. But obviously uh, you then, um, so from places like, uh, Coromut Bay, a cow bombing. Then we move on to a little place called the Right. Now, that's a substantially different wave, guys. And watching some of the video of you guys, and when the camera pulls back and you can see that ledge above the water, it's it really is life and death. How do you psych yourself up to pull into something like this? Uh, it's hard. It's like actually, you just you think about it a lot and then. You kind of just go out there and you're just like, oh, hopefully it's not going to be too big. Hopefully I'll get a couple of nice ones, warm, the, like, warm myself up. And once you get one, next thing you know, you kind of just get the ball rolling. And like, you can have some pretty bad wipeouts out there. Like, people, one guy did uh, drown probably two sessions ago out there, but they brought him back on the ski and it was all good. But, um, and that was only a 10 foot day. That was like, that, that, part, that was probably half the size of that. Yeah, I still reckon that's like, probably the scariest place I've ever surfed in my life, I reckon. Yep. Like the right. It is like a pretty heavy wave. And so especially when that, it gets that, really big. Like where that photographer's sitting there in the water getting ready to is that is that a photographer in the in the line up there underneath the yeah, barrel? That's yeah. So yeah. They're, they're I think what, that's Andrew like, Seymour. Yeah, it's what, five meters maybe from the from dry rock? Uh, no, nah, not five meters. Probably like fifty, I guess. There's a big dry rock behind it, but um, yeah, it's it actually um when it breaks, like you can see the ledge, but by the time you go over, like you're over the ledge, it's only like rarely like you will hit the ledge, eh? And it'd have to be a pretty small day for you to hit the ledge. All right. So and like is it this is offshore? Like how far offshore is this wave? A couple of hundred meters, I think. Just takes oh. ages to get there. And what are the logistics if you fall off? Like if you do get smoked, um, do hold you your breath and pray that you come up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, you're so you guys are so blasé and so um, humble about this experience because um, I mean in Sydney we have some slabs and and that shot just there was probably about as big as what you know. We, yeah, we had waves like this you know in our winter 
Um, that yeah. was the biggest it's ever been. Um, yeah. you know, and Kelly and all that was there, but you know, there's logistics where we surf, like we're close to the rocks. It's kind of like a mini Shipstons, for example. Um, but this is on another level. Is that that wave behind you there, Mick? Yep, that is. That is. But who's the nut job surfing behind you to get that photo? Uh, Mark Matthews is. He's behind <laughs> me on that wave. Uh, you're in trouble now, Wixie. <laughs> quite happily tell him he's a nut job to his face if I haven't already. <laughs> you got, you got no, I reckon that's a fair call. He's a nut job. <laughs> yeah. wow. nut job. What the hell is going on here? Uh, yeah, so the wave before was the day after this one. So I, um, this was like that super swell we had at WA in, what was it, 2016 or something? So this is an interesting story behind this actually. Um, so we started off at Cowley and we we're at Cow the day before and like the swell was too west. Like the swell was big, but it was too west. So it wasn't really doing it. So like we left Cow that Arvo and like we sort of stopped like just past Margaret River. We we're like, all right, what are we doing? Are we going to the right or are we going back to Cow tomorrow? Because like the next day was meant to be the biggest day. And like, we literally sat on the side of the road for half an hour, me and Jared, just like disputing where to go. Like he wanted to go to Cow, and I sort of wanted to go to Cow because it could have been like almost like its biggest ever, like the swell was huge. Then Mark Matthews put up a shot of the right in the Arvo and I swear to God, it's still probably one of the biggest barrels I've ever seen at the right. It was huge. So we're like, all right, we're going to the right. So we got down there, I think it was Friday night. And this was Saturday. So we got out there Saturday and like, it's pretty big, like it's pretty big in the morning. So like there was a few closeouts and stuff and whatnot, but um, sort of around one o'clock, it sort of hit this point, like a few people had gone in, like Mark Matthews and that went in. And then it just got ridiculously big. Like I haven't really seen it that big except for one other time. And you could see it capping out the back. Like it was that big and like, I've never seen it do that. So I was like, oh my God. And then um, we'll just sit in there and these sets come in. And Jared's like, yep, yep, we're up. I was like, all right, yeah, yeah. He's like, mate, don't even look at it. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it's fucking huge. I was like, oh, fuck her up. <laughs> so I stood up <laughs> and I'm going in and I've looked out the wall. I'm like, oh my God, it is huge. And I'm like, biggest wall ever. <laughs> and then I sort of like, let go and I was like, all right, in a good spot. Then there's like a little lip at the bottom. I was like, oh, fuck, don't fall off here. Don't fall off here. It's like a, almost like a little step. I got down that and then I sort of like positioned myself. But I'll tell you the thing about this wave. It wasn't my best wave that day. Like it would have been my biggest, but I couldn't really see anything. Hey? Like it's all happening behind me. Like for as far as I knew, I was on the shoulder. And then I sort of like... From where you are in the wave, it would have looked like about like a double head high wave. Like I'm just looking at that barrel up like a third of the way up the face. Yeah, man. It, like, <laughs> <laughs> it just looked like a big wall in front of is me. That, is, like that a, a hey? is that a boil just in front on the screen? In, like at the very bottom of the screen there? Uh, yeah, there's a boil and then there's like the reef there. So this one sucked pretty hard off the reef. The reef is, but, okay. um, <laughs> but um, it's funny, like, because when I come off at the end of this and I washed up, so like, I went underneath, like, through the channel and come up next to the rock on the other side, like, and I was like, doing that at a wave like that, that never happens, you know, unless it's like closing out. And that's when I knew it was like solid. And then everyone in the channel, so was like looking at me, shaking their heads. I spoke to Chris Brown, I was like, oh, how was that one? Like, was I sort of like in there he's like mate you're as far as deep as you could have got but mate that was like the biggest wave i've ever seen here i was like nah surely not and then everyone else said the same thing and then i seen the photos i was like oh my god it was huge i didn't feel that big but you know like i didn't really get barreled so it sort of wasn't the best wave i got that day but still pretty cool photo i reckon it's a great shot, mate. I think I wouldn't come off my wall if I had if I had the shot like that. <laughs> and, and then you guys have decided that you better go across to Europe and take on some of the biggest waves over there. Yeah, yeah Nazare. Right. Yeah, Nazare is a um, pretty special place. Eh? Like when me and Jared first went over there, we went over there for like a month and a half, two months. And like, 
no joke. Like, there wasn't many people around, eh? Like, um, I probably caught my biggest wave ever that, in those two months. But there's no one around. Like, we surfed a lot of times by ourselves out there. And, like, we didn't really have photographers or anyone with us. So, we sort of just relied on the local people who were up there taking photos to get photos of them. But, um, pretty big place, eh? Like, it definitely almost... You know, like when you're out there, it feels a lot bigger and looks a lot bigger than what it actually looks like from on the cliff. Sort of got a weird perception of it. I cliff. remember, I think it was you and Jared. It might have actually been Dan and Jared I was talking to after one of the first trips. And you were, you, in fact, it was the second or third trip, I think. And you got like smashed and I'd like, driven onto the beach. And basically you were saying that the shore break there, uh, once you're in the white water stuff, that shore break is harder to deal with than any other wave you'd ever surf. So considering... Mate, it's hectic. <laughs> <laughs> it's hectic. Oh, it's like 80 foot out the back going on to the shore. We got absolutely smoked. Like It was our first day out there, jet ski. We were like 20 metres up the beach and the jet ski was like 50 metres down the beach. Like It was ridiculous. Like We got absolutely smoked. And that, was yeah. only like, that wasn't even a big day, you know. Like that, that first day was only like 20 foot. And like 20 foot is big, but like, when you're talking Nazare style, like Nazare gets like 80 foot, you know, like there's huge waves out there. It's crazy. So speaking of uh, consequences, Dan, I think we, um, we just about saw a shot there a, a minute ago. I'll pop it back up on the screen. What's, what's, uh, what's going on in this picture? This is obviously uh, prior to uh, Huey's Choice Wax. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was actually. It was last year. Um, <laughs> I think it was just before I got married, so it would have been April. And... Um, it was, this day was super raw, big. It would have been 15, 20 foot. We got there, weren't, weren't expecting much. And then all of it, like, it was just big and so but gnarly. And we're like, all right, let's surf. And this would have been my second or third wave in the start of the day. So we got there from like 6.30 onwards. And I uh, just took the wrong line, did a like casual check store. And then next thing you know, I get sucked up the face. And I tried to ride it out. And then just got to a point that I couldn't. And... Yeah, had to jump, and what well, wasn't it for a bad jump? But then once I got hit in water, I got thrown back over, then pushed super deep. Instantly, as I got thrown back over, blew my ear, both the eardrums, uh, and it was just deep. And I pulled my vest once, it did nothing happen. I had to pull my vest again, and then blew up. And I remember trying to swim to the surface, and just going. I'm almost there. Then I feel this wave just roll over my head, and that was the second wave. I was like, oh, here we go. I'm in for it. Oh, so and I kind of just... Vest. Sorry? Even with the vest on, you just rolled. Yeah, I pulled it twice and nothing happened. Well, the second time it happened and I was still down for two waves. And, and I didn't even think about my ears at the time. But then I came up and just got up with enough air and kind of just survived and just lying, rolling around because all my balance was lost because I blew my eardrums and... Kind of gave out and go, you just like, thank God I can see daylight. And then um, that, they that picked board, me up. That board behind you, is that the board that's in this picture? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, my, that's my special board. <laughs> that's the one that gets me with good waves. And, and so um, obviously, you know, once you're going out to surf stuff like this, you need to know your equipment. Um, how do you go out and try something new when you're going into... A, a life and death situation like this. How do you how do you not just stick with what you're used to? I'm curious because obviously I speak to Bert Berger quite a bit. You know Sebastian yeah. quite well. You guys would do, um, and so you know playing around with some slightly different design equipment and that sort of thing. How do you get the balls to try something new rather than just taking out a board you already know and trust? Um, to be honest, I've had this board for about six seven years, I reckon. Like I've had it for a long, long time and just, I trust that. And I, I guess, I don't know, boards are expensive. So that's one reason I don't just go through them. If I broke it, I'll buy a new one. But um, like you said, I just trust it so much. And the fins I use, I trust so well. And it's actually, when I used to ride for shapers, I got some toe fins made. And, um, and everyone uses them over here. They love them. It's just, I guess, a go-to fin. So I don't, I don't walk away from it too much. Looks like you lean forward a bit better on the next one. Is this the... Is this, <laughs> that's the same way. Before I jump. <laughs> oh, so that's, that's the before that's the oh. shot, is it? Oh, I see. Yeah. And Different on angle. The, on the equipment perspective, how big's that tow board? Five nine. 
five nine. It's it's about what is it like in maybe inch and three quarters or something? Like it's maybe two, but yeah, there's not much in it. And it's a uh, pin tail and just a thruster. I always just use thruster as what I trust and feel and yeah. sort of about. And how about you, Mick? Well, an important part of the uh, of the equation, of course, in your equipment is your tow partner. And sorry, while we're talking about trusting your equipment, Mick, you um, went to take part in the uh, big wave event over at uh, Nazare, uh, and you lost your tow partner at the last second and got substituted in with Ross Clark Jones, who is his own special kind of nut job. Um, but uh, how does that work? Have you, have you had you done much time with, with Ross before? Because obviously there must be a really good bond between. No, Ryan. I've definitely towed with Ross before, but um, he's the one that couldn't come into the comp in February, so he got substituted out, and I went with Axi Munion from Spain. Oh, that's right. Sorry, you and Ross were the team. That's right. Then you got yeah, a last minute replacement for for Ross yeah. getting big crook. Yeah. So I'd seen Axi out there many times before, like so I knew what he's capable of, like um. It's funny, eh? Like, um, you sort of get in your routines with your team member and whatnot. So it was different. Like, he liked different things and I liked different things. But um, as long as one of us got, like, some good waves, it's all good, eh? Like, um, I hadn't surfed in ages before that comp. And, like, <laughs> it was funny. Like, it was like I was literally in Portugal for, like, a day to surf, eh? Because my missus was pregnant. So she was about eight and a half months pregnant. And we had a cyclone in Port Hedland, so I had to drive up to Broome, which is about six hours north, catch my plane to Perth, then I flew out to Portugal, got there in the Arvo, which is, it's like a 21-hour flight or something, got there in the Arvo, slept that night, and woke up a lot four or five in the morning, and then surfed all day, and then we had the Prezos about seven o'clock that night, I went to bed at like nine, and then flew out the next morning at like four or five in the morning. Like, I was wrecked, eh? <laughs> like, I don't normally like to do it like that, but, um, yeah, the missus is pregnant and um, she could have popped at any moment. I'm, I'm getting, like, I've got so many questions I want to ask you guys, but you're kind of answering them as I talk. But um, they're a little bit deeper. They're not just surface. And I think a few people out there would just, you know, probably want to know the deeper answer to it. I mean, you're about to have a kid. Um, your wife's, you know, heavily pregnant. Uh, you guys both working, you've got commitments at home, probably got investments and stuff as well. What is it that possesses you guys to just, just not just your nut job or whatever, but what, what is the reasons behind it? What makes you, what's the burning desire that makes you just drop everything to chase a swell and, and waves of this magnitude? Um, I probably don't do it as much anymore now with a kid and that. So, um, and I live in Port Helen, so it's a lot harder for me to chase, but, um, I tell you what, back in the day, just like always had mates doing it, you know. So like you always go, you always see your mates at a swell. So like no matter where you're on the world, you see your mates there. And I think that's probably one of the most special things, like that makes you drop it. Like of course, like you could get the right of your life, and like to be honest, it is one of the most amazing things being out there, seeing the ocean like that. You're looking at some of the biggest swell lines you've ever seen. Some of your mates are doing the craziest things you've ever seen. And then, like, you're always so nervous when you go out. Like, you're always super nervous. You don't know what's going to happen. But as soon as you get that first one or two waves, you've got your monkey off the back, you're just loving it. Like, the biggest smile, like, so happy. Like, and the adrenaline rush was huge, you know. Like, a um, couple of days afterwards, you do get a come down from it because you've just been peaking so hard about it. But I tell you what, like, um. I've probably taken a sit b step back from it now, like so much, like just because I've got my little boy and um, that. So I've sort of more focused on my career now and providing a life for him. So, but I definitely will definitely surf big waves again. It's just, I'm not going to chase it like I used to. And how about you, Dan? Mate, I reckon it's it kind of what Mick said, you know, that there were your mates, but I, I really think, like having that adrenaline go through, but like, I just love that feeling. But like, I don't know, like you guys know, like having that, like you go surfing, it's a perfect wave where you catch a really good wave, or you know the waves gonna be pumping. You get like the butterflies, you this like kind of, I can get one, and then, like, even if you get like don't or do get one, like you still, I just love having that. Well, say if I did get one, I'd like that feeling. Yeah. Of like just nothing is better, like you know. 
it kind of you guys oh, seem yeah. desensitized like the scale of what you guys are doing for i mean i want to get into my next question about sponsors and preparation obviously it's not the same level as what some of the the big buck athletes get but it is extraordinary what you guys do. It is phenomenal. And you are just so humble about it. And what's your routine? Like, obviously, you're chasing that adrenaline, but you've got to have the body to match because, yeah, it's just yeah. Oh, the, long, yeah. the late nights, the preparation, all of that is exhausting just before you even get in the water. So what do you guys do? Like, we're cross-training and, like, you know, you have sponsors that help out with this stuff or? Um, I... Like, I, I go to the gym, I surf a lot, and I don't do much breath up. I've done, like, training courses, like, through Shark Eyes and One Ocean International. Like, that was, like, breath, breathing training and also the safety side because I want to try and have a lot of people out there having, like, the safety because, obviously, stuff could go wrong real quick. So, having all that in place and then also the equipment, knowing that my board I use is dialed in. I don't even take bins out. I'll just leave them in there, don't but just in case they get loose, you know, or just don't touch the board and then just only wax it up and just know it's going to be ready. And and also, like, checking the jackets the night before because you don't want to go down there and realise you've got a puncture in your jacket. And uh, I have forgotten one time a bladder from the jacket one time and like, I still surfed. That was pretty stupid, but, like, I just made sure I was, like, can't fall off just because I didn't want to miss out, you know. It's just like drove all the way there and I was just like didn't want to miss out on the great experience but like I'd, I'd try and keep pretty fit and surf a lot that's what I mainly do just kind of you know that having that surf fitness helps out a lot and it's reading the ocean you know yeah that's what I do I think the yeah, biggest think- thing I think the biggest thing is um staying surf fit you know like having your feet in the wax and paddling around is like pretty good and also um stretching stretching does help a fair bit but the biggest thing is the mentality around it, I think, like being able to stay calm in those situations. Like, that's the thing that's really going to get you through. Like, Did you can you be on unf- Foster's thing, the, the breathing training with Jade? Uh, no, but she did stretch me out a fair <laughs> bit, which is pretty good. She's really good at that. Probably, like, to be honest, probably one of the best at it. So, I had a lot of back problems from back in the day from surfing and stuff. And, like, couple of sessions with her she sorted it right out you know like she's pretty good at what she does oh true now um i couldn't resist dan when you were talking about your physical training and stuff i had to put up that picture back when you had your pudgy belly um, i wait don't wait for the shot off of me now though <laughs> <laughs> but I, I found another or in fact mick marlin sent me through a bunch of photos but i think you guys might enjoy this one. Oh yeah so there we go so uh, this is uh, yell mail. a yell mail final and uh, yep. so obviously Ron and uh, Jared Foster, how's the hairstyle? But, <laughs> that, that were the days. You know, I, I miss those longboarding days where we're all together down there and surfing and just doing comp to comp up north, down south, in Perth, you know. Mate, the longboarding days were the best. Like yeah. the only reason I went into those comps was because everyone else was in them. It was yeah. like literally just to go and hang out with everyone. But you, yeah. you, now, you, now you see your mates out the back of 30 foot, TPs in the middle of the bloody ocean. It's a different type of brotherhood. <laughs> and mate, we're still, we're still from <laughs> I don't know. Those longboard days were pretty good, I reckon. Yeah. Especially with the family and stuff. And you guys are always fun to watch and commentate. Obviously, I was lucky enough to see you at uh, in, in your prime longboarding years. But I do remember the exact day when I realised I wasn't going to be coming surfing with you guys anymore when you said it was going to be a big day. Um, so... Uh, I think you guys remember the day we were talking about it the other day. The morning. But um, just uh, where, where Ron stayed on the beach. Yeah. Um, so tell me, what, guys, how big is too big? Um, I don't know. I think the question is, like, how crazy is too crazy? Because I've been out down at Esperance and I didn't even get off the ski one time. I was like, there is no way I'm surfing this wave just like too shallow, too big. Like it wasn't even like huge, huge. It was like 20, 25 foot maybe, but it was like super shallow and in front of rocks. And I was like, there's no way I'm surfing this. And then my mate surfed it and he got like pole driven into the reef and like we thought he broke his pelvis and everything. So, and I'll never surf Cyclops again. Yeah, Cyclops <laughs> is like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. 
Is that one of the worst ones? <laughs> Mate, it is it's so dumb. shallow. <laughs> Everyone that goes there usually only goes there once and doesn't come back. <laughs> yeah. I caught one wave there. I'll never catch a wave again there. You ever. guys have been on a lot of the places where you're going is actually the location. I think Maddie sort of was heading towards that before logistics wise. When you are somewhere like Shipstone's Bluff, for example, in Tasmania, if the worst comes to worst, you're quite a long way from any sort of help. Does that add a different element to it, going to remote places? I mean, obviously, you can go and surf pipeline, and if you get smashed on the reef, you wash up on the beach in 50 metres. But um, some of the places you guys go, you're a long way from help. Does that affect your planning? Uh, not, no, it does. But like, like I was telling Matt and you guys before, um, there is these safety causes that well, I did this year, and all those like, plans and what to do. There is an incident, like who to call, like call the helicopter, what to do if they've like, done their back or they're unconscious, bring them back to life. And so we get, oh, I've, well, I've been trained to be able to deal with those situations. And usually the people you go out with has that same kind of trailing. So, you know, if you stuff up, that there's gonna be someone there to help you, you kind of need someone there, you know? Well, is there a type of course for anyone who's listening who finds that interesting? Cause I know, I do myself. What, where, what is that course? How can you, you, um, you look shark it up? Eye. Yeah, so if you go onto, say, like Instagram page or Facebook page, Shark Eyes, it's um, Shark Eyes is that sticker they put on the bottom of the board, like for the shark deterrence. And One Ocean International, which is like a free diving course they, or company they do. And if you go onto their pages and you flick down, they've got courses all the time, especially coming up now. But if you speak to them, you can go, I want to do like the safety big wave course or I want to practice my free driving. I want to hold my, be able to hold my breath for like five minutes, you know? Um, one question we had from someone who tuned in, they asked um, what sea life have you encountered in these places? Because um, uh, Kira asked, was that a boil in the photo? And so Kira, on a wave like that, the sea, the sea bed is completely visible and obviously you can see a lot when it's that clear. So what have you guys seen? And you have to have seen some nasties out there well, in the ocean. I'll be honest, like, I've seen like odd fin, but nothing like too bad. Like, cause we always usually sit on our jet skis at the back. So you're not floating in the water. But um, Mick's probably a good one to ask about this. Surfing engine up, he's got a good story. Actually, well, I wouldn't say a good story, but like a, a shark encounter story. Is that why you made that face when you saw that photo from engine up? I hate engine up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I can it up. <laughs> There's a lot of sharks there, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, so I was surfing car parks up where you were surfing that day. So um, I was surfing there. It's pretty good, like it's in the Arvo. It's about, it would have been like six foot or something, five, six foot. It was pretty nice. And there would have been about 10 of us out there. So I was sort of sitting out the back and some guy paddled up just on the inside of me. I was just sitting there waiting for a set. I heard this whoosh. I was like, what the hell is that? I turned around. I couldn't see him. I was like, what? where the fuck's he gone? And then I turned my head and there was the biggest fin sitting next to me. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, like, he didn't even tell you. You just paddled my brother's scrape off. <laughs> well, <laughs> he didn't. He actually got launched in the air by it. <laughs> so... I looked out the back and seen the back fin. I was like, oh my God. And like, I knew it was big because like he, the fin was next to me and that back fin was like three or four meters out the back easy. It was huge. And then he's come up screaming. I'm like, oh my God. It's like a horror film. He's like a meter away from me. He's trying to get away. But I think like the leg rope was caught around the shark or something. But he was just going up and down in the water, screaming. I'm like, oh my God, he's, he's dead. Like, I was just waiting for the blood cloud to come out. But <laughs> he got lucky, eh? Like, um, he sort of was like next to the head of the shark, like where the sort of side fin was. And the shark was going nuts. And I don't think it could have got him, but at that stage, I think the shark was just trying to get away too. And like, I turn around and everyone's already halfway in. I'm like, oh my God. But as he was screaming, like his brother was paddling towards him going, I'm coming for you, mate. I'm coming for you. Just hold on. And then like a set came. I was like, fuck, like, what am I going to do? Like, do I help him? And like, no, there was like, honestly, 
<laughs> when you've got a shark that big next to you, it's like a submarine, eh? Like, there's nothing you can do, like, nothing whatsoever you can do. So I caught that first wave in, but that shark, <laughs> that shark went, like, sort of submerged and, like, he sort of, like, got let go. And he caught the wave in behind me. And he got to the beach and we're like, oh, my God, man, are you all right? Like, he's sweet. Like, he didn't even have, like, anything. We just sort of huddled around his board, like, looking like you could see where the nose of the shark, like, hit his board. And he's like, first thing he said to us, like, fuck, guys, sorry for screaming. I was like, man, are you for real? Like, <laughs> they, <laughs> he almost got eaten then. Like, <laughs> don't they, apologize. They really like, breed them tough over West. Weeks, he's always saying it, but. I'm, this has been so insightful because I've, I know a couple of guys who have moved over east and they're just like, like we, we have a guy, Paul, um, from, uh, I forget where he's from, but he's a, he's, a, he's a traditional longboard and he came and moved to Sydney and he was surfing in the red and yellow flags and he'd never seen a set of flags. He'd never surf. He'd only surf reefs, you know? Right. And the lifeguard paddled out on his knees like, and he's just like, how's this? You know, so-and-so. Look at him. He's, you know, he's like, let me look at him. You know, and I was like, oh, yeah, he's all right. But he actually didn't identify himself. He didn't have any cap on or anything. And he's like, mate, he goes, stop taking the waves. And I was like, oh, we're kind of in the flags, mate. Like, you, we sort of got to let him go. And he's like, no, 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 you can't have that, mate. He's dropping in on us. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Anyway, they had a bit of a tuffle, like their board set. And old mate wanted to take his board. And he goes, no, nah, you can't do that, mate. He's like, <laughs> he's like, you can't take me board. And they were having the biggest tiff, and I was like, oh, it's just it's different over here, mate. And I thought, oh, he's such a classic, but it sounds like you guys are exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I'll tell you what, we've had our like, boards almost taken off us by the lifeguards too, <laughs> but we just run away. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take your surfboard. <laughs> no. <laughs> How does your mum go these days? Because I know your mum's up, actually up visiting and uh, looking at the grandbaby, uh, Mick. But um, yeah. I know... A few years ago when you guys first started doing your silly wave competitions and things, watching your mum watching the webcast was hilarious. She sort of she wanted to watch, but she didn't want to see what you were doing. How does, how does she go now knowing that you two are putting yourself into some of those silly situations? Has she gotten used to it or does she still freak out? No, nah, they still get nervous. Like I try to get mum and dad to come over to Nazare to watch. And dad was like, No, nah, I can't watch you do that. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. But, you know, it's going to be like a spectacle. Like, you only get to see it probably once, you know. But, nah, they, they just like to know that we're safe afterwards, They eh? So, generally, give them a buzz or a message or something. Let them know where we're in and whatnot. Then they like to see the photos. Dad likes to see the photos and the footage afterwards. So does mum. So, <laughs> how, how's young Mitchell going these days? I haven't seen Mitch for a while. Last time I saw him on a longboard, he was surfing really good. Um, for you guys, I'm not sure. Mitch is the younger brother of Mick and Dan, and he was a little bit of a little bit of a shit kid, but he's looks. He's, he's <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I tell you what, he's killing it these days. Eh? He's a uh, plumber. He's got a new Hilux. He used to date an engineer, but now he's dating a doctor, so he's going pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he picked up some of the moves from his big bros back in the day. So, uh, I don't know if we had those moves, mate. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I know that the missuses are probably watching, so I won't, um, I won't disagree with you. Um, so uh, you, you did okay. But um, what I want to know is, have you, have you had any like um, fame recognition moments? Walking down the street, someone's gone, that's those guys, that's that guy. Mate, not me, but Mick Corbett. Fuck. Definitely me. <laughs> I tell you what, I had someone, like, I was over in Manly, I had, like, this couple come up to me and ask me for my signature. I was like, are you sure you want my signature? They're like, yeah, you're Chris Pratt, aren't you? I was like, no. (laughs) 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 And I was over there for the big wave awards too. I was like, how's these guys? (laughs) I should have rolled with it, though. (laughs) <laughs> well, I know that I've, looked, I've got some fairly high profile friends and acquaintances who are extremely excited to meet you guys. Um, I know I, I gave you guys a contact of a mate of mine, Michael, the photographer in uh, in the States. And he was... Yeah, Michael Voorhees. Michael Voorhees, yeah. I mean, and yeah. he's he's friends with the who-who of everybody. You know, he was uh, you know, Lance Armstrong's official photographer for seven years in a row. And... Danica Patrick, the um, IndyCar drummer. I mean, he, he's the official photographer for the Miami Dolphins cheerleaders. I mean, he was frothing to meet you guys. 
do, yeah. do, do, do you get that? And who's the most um, famous person who's come and tried to suck up to you because of your big wave skills? Um, I don't know if that's how you guys would put it, but who, who have you been lucky enough to meet because of your uh, es escapades? Oh, what a remember that one time we saw, we did, I think we did meet him, but we, we were standing probably a couple of metres from him, Tony Hawk in America. That was pretty cool. Well, so you made a guy a Metallica. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, bass player. I met the bass yeah. player of Metallica. Yeah, I can't um. remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys, you guys have met the um the guy who who directs the uh the pod the uh Oz Longboarding podcast too, Weeksy. Right? Weeksy, yeah, we're good mates of Weeksy. I still get nervous around him. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, all the girls do too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's for that's for different reasons. Though. <laughs> Weeksy said he really does want to go out and learn how to do some big wave surfing, and he's keen to go with you next time the cow bomb is going off. Yeah, yeah I'll be, I'll, we'll get I'll some floaties for him. I'll bring my drone and my video camera and I'll stick yeah. with them. Thanks. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, Kira yeah. wants to learn as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Come on, come on um, Hey, don't worry. We've also been, uh, we've got Peter from Classic Malibu gluing together a 14 footer for uh, Sean to go out the Outer Banks or um, out off uh, the big snapper swell in the next cycling. There you go. There you go. Not a problem. Well, have a look at the um, backdrop I just put up. Oh, can go the wrong way. That's um, <laughs> morning at Kira, and that's seventy-five-year-old Bob McElwain just styling. So, leggy well, yeah, right, on the leggy on the left foot too. He's a good. He's a good human, Rob. <laughs> Rob. Mate, yeah, no, it's a good shot of him. But yeah, um, yeah Kira looked a... like that again for ages. So yeah, don't bother coming. <laughs> Someone wearing a steamer at Kira. Oh, yeah, they're all soft. They really are. <laughs> like Kira steamer. Cotton. And this, is it pretty common for people to wear the leggy on the front <laughs> foot? Uh, hey. I'm not sure. It's a new no, I got a friend. I actually have a friend that does it as me. Me, no, mate, that does it as well. And his dad does it as well. Did so. Honor win the World Longboard Tour with a leggy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Honor Lou is like, forgets which foot to put it on. No, no joke. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen heaps of like it's random. The people you least expect they put on the wrong foot sometimes, and it's like, wow. Yeah, like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you guys even use leg ropes? No, nah. nah, not when it's big. Yeah, unless we're paddling, but we try not to paddle. Yeah, and do you paddle in? I know we're talking about skis. Or that's another question I had. Um, you know, at what's you guys have big guns that you're paddling in, or is it mostly just tow like tow specialists? Mostly, mostly tow, tow. like um. I had a little stint where I was paddling like Mavericks and Jaws and um, Nazare like a couple times, but yeah, a lot more waves towing. But when you go to places like Jaws and Mavericks, you do have to paddle. So but well, I'll tell you what, the crew at Mavericks, probably the best crew you could ever paddle with. Those guys are the most funniest blokes ever, eh? Like there'll be a set coming in and they're cracking jokes. <laughs> like it makes you actually want to go out there and just chill out there and hang with them. And what's the vibe like Like when you're on the wave, on those, you know, 20 foot plus waves, you know, the exhilaration of paddling. Is paddling more dangerous or is towing more dangerous? Uh, it just depends, you know, like um, generally like if we're towing, it's like pretty big, eh? And like um, there's not a lot of places to paddle in WA, so we're always like towing. But um, if you're towing over like Jaws and Mavericks and Nazare, like it's pretty big, eh? Like... Mm -hmm. um. Nazare is probably it's pretty much the craziest wave. I don't think it's as as heavy as the right, but the right's got like the potential to break here. I reckon Nazare's definitely got the most potential to drown someone, and that has been the case over the years. Like numerous people have drowned and been resuscitated on the beach and whatnot. And these guys are experienced too, you know. Like it's not like just randoms coming in and surfing. It's generally like well prepared people who know what they're doing. So. Mm -hmm just one of those things and have you hunted the, the famous uh i guess the emerging big wave spots of the the you know the beginning of of big wave surfing the 60s and 70s like pipe and waimea and sunset have you had much you know success in hawaii no i have but to be honest never been to oahu ever <laughs> been to maui but um i don't know i've sort of never really wanted to go there like i do want to go there but 
it's pretty hard to get a wave. There's a long way to go, not to get too many waves, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, I think we got some world-class waves over here, like waves that sort of almost rival pipe in terms of barrels like that. So, it's pretty hard to go past them. Well, yeah, most people use Hawaii as their initial stomping ground, I suppose. But you guys have got your bypass that. I suppose it's the same with a lot of the guys surfing shippies as well. Yeah. You know, and, and owls as well. You know, in that the last 10 years, 15 years, you know, the, the Sydney guys have had that advantage. And I guess the bodyboarders too. You know, they've had that advantage in WA, South Coast, New South Wales to be able to, um, you know, cut their teeth in some different style of sort of slabs i guess that's so different hawaii you know it's oh 100 percent. and like you know like you go over there like you can get those waves here like you and we've got heaps of them right you've got heaps on the east coast we've got heaps here south australia it's like it's hard to go all right i'm going to go to pipe and fight with 100 people for a wave yeah. when we're generally out with our mates here or with a couple other people just surfing you know like Toomey's. Like Toomey's is a great example. We can drive 12 hours, even though it sounds 12 hours sounds far, but it go up north and you got one of the best lefts going around. Long, big left hand of the barrels and gives you a couple of turn sections. I guess you've got elements of Hawaii, Bali, and your own, you know, and, and South Coast, New South Wales, all on your coastline. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So a couple of times there you've touched on. Uh, different incidents in the water, like bursting eardrums and that. What are the worst injuries you guys have had? Broke my ankle in Indonesia, pulling into a barrel when I was out for a while. That, that was probably a pretty bad experience. I had to fly home. And I wasn't medi back because I was working over there. So I just jumped on the plane or jumped on a boat to Nias, spent the night in Nias, went to a dodgy hospital, scanned it, was broken, stayed the night and then jumped on a plane, then jumped on another plane and then another plane and finally rock, rocked up from Perth and then straight in the hospital for about six days. Ooh. And um, they, had, they couldn't give it surgery because I had a cut on it and um, cut on my broken ankle and just had to wait for that to heal up before they gave it surgery. So they just gave me some medicine and yeah. It wasn't the best experience. <laughs> well, one of my uh, close friends, Ollie Doucette, uh, was in Bali and was there surfing some big waves and he was sort of fly in, fly out, but was doing the Bali thing. Um, he's working in WA, also doing rope ac access, actually. Um, and, yeah, he lost his leg um, in a, a, an ax car accident and um, ended up having been amputated because it was during their earthquake two years ago. And yeah. um, since he's come back, his big wave surfing has gone from strength to strength. And the reason I asked about your prep and the fitness, cause I was training with him last year in the beginning of this year and the mental, uh, I guess the mental fortitude of that guy to come back from injury, you know, and a, and a life threatening injury and be stuck overseas in that situation. Uh, he said has prepared him to surf. He paddles, you know, Nazare and Depo and all those waves around here. But that's why, I know he is exceptional, but I know how much effort he puts in. But that's why I'm so taken back by both of your guys' uh, you know, humility because it's, it is life-changing stuff that you guys do and you're smiling, you're so casual and, and blasé, but you obviously <laughs> know the risk is there as well. So, you know, do people must just... Is everyone the same over there or is there people who would just... No, everyone's the same, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think every big wave surfer's the same. You know, you talk to them and they're all like casual about it, you know. And I think it's the mentality around it, you know, like just being calm, being able to stay calm about it, you know. I think that's the biggest thing. And I tell you what, I have seen um, photos of Ollie, eh? He's pretty good at what he does, eh? Like at Depot and like that. I've seen him at Nazare too. Yeah, you read... Um... We talk about, uh, there was a famous photo of, some, of uh, another guy, Lockie Rombouts. He's actually a, a part-time longboarder as well, surfing yep. depot. It was on the front cover of Surfing World a few years ago. It was that uh, pig dog on a 10-0. On a yep. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Ollie's taken the same perspective. And these guys look up to me as a longboarder. Um, and yep. it's interesting for them to, to seek approval on their style technique on guns. Because they're like, oh, is that kind of funky? And I'm like, mate. Who cares? You, 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 you're sliding down 20-foot faces, um, making a 10-foot board fit in, in, in a barrel. And they've got this weird technique where they do use that paddle speed 
to their advantage to slice down. And you've got the stall ability on a, you know, when they're paddling in. So yeah, yeah they kind of can like speed up and slow down and Ollie's got one leg. So he uh, is able to, um, you know, twist his prosthetic leg and it sort of like comes off the board and he gets down and he lays his whole body on the board and gets barreled. Um, it's crazy. Eh? Like, just, yeah, redesigning the way he's got to think and big yeah. wave surfing suits him better than yeah. small wave surfing. <laughs> you got to give it to him, eh? Like, that's epic. Yeah. Hey, so yeah there's, uh, you know, watching YouTube, these guys, Mick and Dan, and also Ollie Doucette, he's, they're both, they're all inspirational characters. Now, Mick and Dan, are we going to see you back in a contest jersey at a longboard comp any time in the near future? Yeah, I'm waiting for the over 50s, mate. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rixi, what, uh, what uh, age division are you in? Shut up. I'm, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to, I want to, I want to get in your division. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm still over 40s, technically. I'm not 50 till next year. All right. Or maybe I'll start over 35s, I reckon. Yeah, well, you, you're getting close to 35 now, aren't you? Yeah, what two you more years. 33? 33, yeah. yeah. Gee, that makes me feel old. You were <laughs> little, little kids when I first met you. But um, <laughs> one uh, question we had from a, one of our viewers, his name is Jack Entwistle. Uh, oh, yeah. Hello, Jack. <laughs> and he did ask the question that, uh, that Sean just asked about your worst wipeout. But he also wanted to know, when was the first time you got a proper nugget and you went, yeah, that was a proper nugget. And what did that feel like when you got your first real, you know, chunky big wave? Mick first? Uh, definitely at the right, eh? When that first time we went out and I like um got a wipeout of one of the waves and it was like a pretty heavy wipeout and it was only really small. I was like, oh my God, sort of freaking. But then I think it's the last wave of the day that it got and like it walled up really big and it pulled in and I was like, oh my God, I was just frothing, like couldn't believe it. Like I think I shared that oh. picture like everywhere, <laughs> you know, I was just so stoked on it and um. Yeah, I think that was, I don't know, how old were we, Dan? Uh, 23, 22. Yeah, no, no, I reckon yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. Yeah, well, mine would have been the right as well. We can't really go past it. Um, it was my second time out there. The first time wasn't a good, really that good. I was using a quad and didn't really like it. And then the second time I got my own board, green. This is green board that's just been around the world, or not around the world, but everyone surfed it. And um, yeah, I had a session out there, me, Jared, and we had a mate, Lee Hodgson, filming. And it was just, mate, when you get one and then your confidence goes from zero to 100, and I was just like, let's catch everything. And we just got that many good waves, it was out of control. But like, there was so many in that session. I remember just like coming down, bottom turning and looking up, and like, you just got to pull in, you can't go straight. So you just pull in and the thing just goes over, then you come out. And But even that session, I had a pretty gnarly wipe out. That was probably my first experience and of like a wave chandeliering and just pushing me down. But this is before we also had the pull vest. This is just a old jet pilot flotation device that we used to use. And, but um, that was probably one of my most most memorable sessions, I reckon. It was, I can it tell was, you, is that you guys were surfing what everyone else would be considering a proper chunky wave well before those surfs at the right that you're talking about but i'll uh i'll go with you guys because and this is the thing you, you get that blaseness do, do you find it hard to get an adrenaline rush now or is you, we were talking the other day dan about the preparation the mental mindset building up to it and what happens when you get ready and then the swell doesn't come oh mate then like uh, day two few days before the nerves have gone gone and then like i was probably only down there about a uh Probably about a month ago, I reckon. Went down then. and we thought it was going to be massive. Well, actually, we didn't think it was going to be that big. And then we woke up in the morning and it was just like, shit, it's so much bigger than we thought. And then the nerves kick in even more and you get out there. and well, You feel a bit deflated, but you still have the adrenaline and like, the blood rushing because there's still waves coming through that can hurt you. So, But it is a, it is an emotional roller coaster when you... Get a bit skunked, I guess. Yeah, I know from uh, flying planes in the Air Force, I mean, you fly a jet fighter and you're not, you're not going to get excited about driving fast in a car. Uh, you get desensitized. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Like when you're out there all the time, like we, you go out there and it's big, but you're like, oh, fuck, it could be beer. 
you know, and it's still like 50 foot, you know, you go from Nazare to like Shippies or the Rhine and you're like, oh, like the swell lines are so much smaller, you know, and you do get desensitized, but the beatings are still just as gnarly, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Now, and uh, in closing, let's do a bit of quick housekeeping. So, uh, Dan, are you both part of Tim's new ASMF? Uh, I'm not sure if Mick is because Mick's. Oh, Mick might be, but um. Oh, uh, aren't, aren't I, you I, on this one, Mick? Oh. I, th I think I am. Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, mate uh, I, think, I think I think me and um, Ross are in it from Nazare oh, when yeah. we went with 60 Minutes. But I think the main you're, thing... You're not on the poster, though, are you? You're not on the pictures for the market? No, no, I'm, no, I'm not, mate. No, that's a <laughs> Dan, 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 Dan one. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Dan getting a bit of publicity, mate. Yeah, no, no, I think... It's, it's a bit it's just late to the party. It's, uh, good, to, uh, good, to get, good to get him some spotlight for a change. But, yeah. uh, and, Dan, look, I've, I'll go to you for this particular question because I think you're the only one who can answer it properly. Um, and again, it's about equipment. What's the best wax to use if you're a big wave surfer? Mate, number one, Huey's Choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Huey's Choice, I love it. That was, that was totally unrehearsed. And I'll ask both of you, what's the best wetsuit for a big wave surfer? Oh, wet uh, Volt wetsuits. <laughs> so uh, you guys obviously a big, big part of the team with Volt as well. And um, so obviously we do ask the, our uh, viewers to support Australian companies and uh, Great to have Vault um, producing some fantastic suits. But anything else we need to know about what's coming up with you guys in the near future? Or is it just business as usual, family guys for the time being? Family guys. And then, yeah, just wait for next winter. <laughs> yeah, just family at the moment. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's too much happening with COVID and stuff. So we're planning on going to America for six weeks so that Bub could see the rest of the family. But, um, Unfortunately, we won't be doing that, so we'll just be chilling down south, I think. Uh, I was going to say, well, you just have to go to work for six weeks and have an extra 30K in the, in the bank. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from Matt and Kira? I think I've been, uh, I've been talking too much as per usual. I'm just going to ask if they could please open the borders so we can come over to WA for a trip adventure because we can't go overseas. And that might as well be overseas. It's a seven-hour flight. <laughs> a bit like that, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, about, we've got to get you over here, Kira, and get you, get you into a couple of these ways with the boys. Matty Chinoski, you sort of talked yourself down a little bit as well, but uh, I think you've probably given a bit of a nudge as well based on what we've been seeing you doing on the East Coast this winter. I've never towed, uh, I've never worn an inflatable and up until a few years ago, I was going leashless at our local bombies just for the nostalgic uh, value and boardies in winter and stupid shit like that. But um, <laughs> since, uh, since about a 45 minute swim and um, a two wave sort of hold under, I pulled my head in and, uh, <laughs> you know, started getting my stuff together. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's... Um, it's, it's inspiring seeing what you guys are doing. Um, I do like paddling just with the, you know, the traditional aspect of it and the, the thrill and the aura of being in the ocean and feeling the power when you are paddling out there, you know, and, and feeling so vulnerable. That in itself is addictive. Um, yep. But I, I think the prep and all that doesn't change. doesn't matter if it's, you know, six foot or, or 60 foot, you still get those butterflies if the conditions yep. are aligned and, you know, you've, you've really... Um, focus yourself and you know you've, you've been thinking about it and planning it doesn't matter where you're going if it's a longboard wave you know pumping noosa or um you know it's just it's the search and then when you when everything comes together it's yeah i think it's we we can all relate a little bit maybe not to the in, in the pov vision but um you know it's all it's all relative to anyone watching out there but uh yeah weeksy I'll, I'll call it at um i'll call it at anything where where stuff goes black. <laughs> you know, as in like when you get the black lines, you know. Yeah. yeah. The sky's got black, black numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When when you get those black lumps, like one came in winter this year in Sydney and I, I caught it, but it was all right. It was beachy and I knew I was you know, I knew I was gonna get into the shore eventually and I t intended to go in on it. But uh yeah, when it's black, it's all you guys. <laughs> yeah, and then you see the skis out on the outside just buzzing around. Oh, 
Margaret River, Margaret River main break when every 25 minutes, half an hour, one breaks all the way across to the box, that horizon going dark there, that's one of my least favourite feelings in surfing. But um, <laughs> guys, it's been a pleasure. Next week we've got, uh, well, for someone from up your way, Kira, we've got uh, former world champ Josh Constable's coming on. Sean spoke to him this afternoon to organise it. And uh, hopefully we'll have, we'll have Jack Entwistle back on board. But Dan and Mick, is there anyone you need to give shout outs to? Obviously big g'day to Big Phil. Uh, for taking you to the beach in the first place, but uh, anyone else? Thanks, Mum and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mum's not here. <laughs> oh, she would have loved that. <laughs> She'll watch it later. So, yeah. I, I spoke to Phil earlier on today. I know he'll be tuning in as well. So, good day, big guy. But um, look, the sun's starting or getting ready to go down over the Indian Ocean. Oh, you can't probably can't see it in the background there. It's getting a bit dark. We've been on for an hour and a half, guys. I could chat to you for many more hours, and we've only scratched the surface of the stories. What I'm going to do is go through my hard drives uh, over the next week or so and dig out a whole bunch of longboarding photos from you fellas from over the years, um, because we've sort of obviously haven't spoken much about longboarding today. But uh, I've got a bunch of old shots just to sort of see as you've grown up, and then maybe we'll add in those photos that you guys have kindly sent to me. And there's some videos as well. Is it okay to share all those on our Facebook page? Yeah, go for it, mate. Yep, awesome. So on behalf of all of our viewers, thanks heaps for joining us. I'll put us in, look, the dogs are going nuts just in time. I'll put us in. Time's up. We'll go, we'll go to uh, Brady Bunch mode, so we're all on the screen at the same time. Shut up. But, <laughs> Uh, that's been episode 22. Next week, episode 23. Sean, sorry, mate, have you got something else to say? You look like you're about to pipe up. No, the only thing I've got, um, I believe the boys up at Agnes are about to launch their website and uh, tell everybody that their comp's going to be 16th to the 21st of March. And, um, yeah, I believe you might be involved with that one as well. That's correct. And I'll be uh, producing the marketing or the promotional video for that. And that'll have all the dates and stuff on that. And entry forms will be available in the next week or two. So, uh, but that'll be all part of the video. And then you get to see the good surf from Agnes. I haven't showed anyone the good surf yet. <laughs> you, got, you guys haven't been up there, have you? Up to no. Central Queensland? No. Man, when it was on, it was really good fun. Good longboard, though. Yeah, right. But um, anyway, we better get going because I know some of our grumpy old men viewers will be uh, complaining. Mickey Marlin. I see you. Hey, um, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us, boys. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, you're great ambassadors for the sport and uh, also for our, our great state of WA. But I look forward to seeing you in two years' time in the over 35s division. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks much guys. For watching. Thank you. We'll see you next Thursday, same time, here on Oz Longboarding. Cheers, everyone. Bye.